It's an honor tonight to introduce Elizabeth Strout, author of the novels Amy and Isabel, Abide With Me, and the Pulitzer Prize winning novel in stories, Olive Kitteridge. She's with us tonight to discuss her new novel, The Burgess Boys, the story of three siblings from Maine who are, as adults, still in a state of emotional lockdown resulting from an accident when they were children that took the life of their father. The narrative centers on an incident in which one of the characters throws a pig's head inside a mosque in a small town in Maine, setting off tensions between the Maine natives and the large population of Somali refugees. Because our format tonight will be a little bit different than usual, and I'm very excited to be in conversation with Elizabeth, instead of telling you anything more about the book, uh, we're going to get right to it. But first, please help me welcome Elizabeth Stratt. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for, for everybody coming out. My goodness, on a Tuesday night. Um, <laughs> What I'm, what I'm going to do is read to you just a couple of pages, um, the page, about a page and a half from the last part of the prologue, and then just the very first page of the novel. And that way you can sort of hear the writer's voice. And then I'm going to talk with Susan about the book, and then we will talk to you um, about whatever you'd like to talk about. So this is the end of the prologue, where um, a first-person narrator is sort of describing why she's writing the book. And so it began, like a cat's cradle connecting my mother to me and me to Shirley Falls. Bits of gossip and news and memories about the lives of the Burgess kids supported us. We reported and repeated. I told my mother again about the time I had come across Helen Burgess, Jim's wife, when they lived, as I once did, in the neighborhood of Park Slope in Brooklyn. The Burgesses moved there from Hartford, and after the Packer trial, Jim taking, Jim taking a f job with a large firm in Manhattan. My husband and I one night found ourselves dining near Helen and a friend in a Park Slope cafe, and we stopped near Helen's table as we were leaving. I'd had some wine, I suppose that's why I stopped. And I said to her that I'd come from the same town Jim had grown up in. Something happened to Helen's face that stayed with me. A look of quick fear seemed to pass over it. She asked my name and I told her, and she said Jim had never mentioned me. No, I was younger, I said. And then she arranged her cloth napkin with a little shake and said, I haven't been up there in years. Nice to meet you both. Bye-bye. My mother thought that Helen could have been friendlier that night. She came from money, remember. She'd think she was better than someone from Maine. This sort of remark was one I had learned to let go. I no longer bothered myself with the defensiveness of my mother and her Maine. But after Susan Burgess's son did what he did, after the story about him had been in the newspapers, even in the New York Times and on television too, I said on the phone to my mother, I think I'm going to write the story of the Burgess kids. It's a good one, she agreed. People will say it's not nice to write about people I know. My mother was tired that night. She yawned. Well, you don't know them, she said. Nobody ever knows anyone. <laughs> and just the first paragraph of chapter one. On a breezy October afternoon in the Park Slope neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, Helen Farber Burgess was packing for vacation. A big blue suitcase lay open on the bed, and clothes her husband had chosen the night before were folded and stacked on the lounge chair nearby. Sunlight kept springing into the room from the shifting clouds outside, making the brass knobs on the bed shine brightly and the suitcase become very blue. Helen was walking back and forth between the dressing room with its enormous mirrors and white horsehair wallpaper, the dark woodwork around the long windows, walking between that and the bedroom, which had French doors that were closed right now, but in warmer weather opened onto a deck that looked out over the garden. Helen was experiencing a kind of mental paralysis that occurred when she packed for a trip, so the abrupt ringing of the telephone brought relief. When she saw the word private, she knew it was either the wife of one of her husband's law partners, they were a prestigious firm of famous lawyers, or else her brother-in-law, Bob, who'd had an unlisted number for years but was not and never would be famous at all. <laughs> well, thank you. That was lovely. 
Um, this book was inspired by a real event, uh, and I wondered if you could talk about that and whether you knew right away when you'd heard this story about the, the pig's head and the mosque, if you knew that there was a novel in there you needed to write. Well, the story um, of the Burgess Boys had actually started before that incident occurred, because I'm a very slow writer, and and so I I had Bob and Jim, you know, kind of, and Susan even, but it was really the boys. I had them sort of um, floating around on my various tables for for many years, and trying to sort of figure out their story and the voice to tell it and all that sort of thing, and then this. Um, in real life, Pig's Head incident did occur in Lewiston, Maine, and as soon as it occurred, I was tremendously um, intrigued by it, and of course, as a citizen, upset by it. Um, it was a terrible, terrible act, um, and the community was, I think, quite, quite fabulous, really, um, in what they did. And so I became very interested in that and realized almost automatically that this, of course, was part of the Burgess Boys narrative. So I did a tremendous amount of research about the Somali um, community and what it's like to be, uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, seven-year knowledge of work of what it would possibly be like to be a Somali um, person over here uh, trying to, to take on uh, America as a, as a new kind of home. I have a little bit of sinus issue, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not <laughs> contagious, it's just the blossoms. Um, and one of my favorite passages from the book uh, describes in simple but really compelling detail uh, this, this real disconnect that you describe so well between rural Maine and the larger world where you know even, even Jewish culture is completely alien, yeah. never mind. Somali culture, and you right. capture that so well in this scene that I wonder if I could get you to sure. to just read uh, a paragraph or two. This is set at a rally. Yes, there's a rally in Shirley Falls is the name of the town um, in Maine. And Bob and Jim, who live in New York, have gone back up to the rally um, as former citizens. So what I'm going to read is just a brief description of that. People in down vests and jeans were standing around. Old people with white hair and wide hips moved slowly. The Somalis were gathered mostly near the playground. The Somali men wore western clothes, Bob noticed, a few with smock-like shirts beneath their coats. But the Somali women, many big-cheeked, some thin-faced, wore robes that went to the ground, and some of their head coverings reminded Bob of the nuns that used to walk around this same park when he was a boy. Except they weren't like that, because many of these scarves were fluttery and bright, as though a new kind of foliage had found its way to the park, orange, purple, yellow. The mind always wants to find something familiar to snap itself onto, doesn't it, Bob said to Jim, something familiar so it can say, like that. But nothing's familiar about this. It's not like the Franco Festival or Moxie Days. Shut up, Jim said quietly. <laughs> and in your experience, is it really the disconnect is really that profound with the, the influx of Somali refugees? Too? Well, let's put it this way. I mean, Maine demographically is the whitest state in, in this country, and it is the oldest state in this country. So you can imagine to have um, a dark-skinned population move into a town that had um, been for 30 years you know, once the textile stopped, quite an event. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think there's, there's always a disconnect in any situation where there's some degree of isolation. It, it certainly doesn't have to be Maine. Um, I think it can be anywhere. Even, you know, New York City has its own pockets of isolation and, and provincialism. So I think that that's really what, what we're talking about mm -hmm. is, is isolation, whether in real terms or, you know, emotional terms. And this, this novel, in a way, is a, it's sort of a story about storytelling. You, you begin by telling a story. Um, there's, you know, as with any novel, there's many subplots, but it, it's in, it's all about storytelling at, at some level. And I wonder if you're one of those writers who, when you sit down to tell a story, do you know the story? At the outside? I don't. I, I never know what I'm doing when I sit down. <laughs> um, um, a ever. I, I have a uh, you know a vague general idea. Um, sometimes I will even start because of. Um, 
the way uh, the light is coming through the underneath the door or something will be triggered off or there will be some sort of abiding image that just doesn't go away um, and with the Burgess boys it was this sense of relationship between the older brother Jim and the younger brother Bob and the fact that they had gone through this tragic loss of their father at a very young age and that just kept kind of staying in my mind and and, and I just really began to like them a lot and that was that was the main thing but no I don't know what I'm doing and I think that's why it takes me so long do you uh do you draft the whole thing and then oh, sort no. of go back and figure <laughs> it out no um no <laughs> no I don't I I don't know what I do really well, it, I really, it works whatever well it doesn't for a long time um, you know, I, I, I just keep making a mess and making a mess, and there's always always a time, and, and it can be a long time, when there's almost a sense of panic, you know, like how, and, and particularly with all the research that I had done um, for to, to try and equate myself with a Somali situation, um, it, it, you know, and I'm not an organized person, so it literally, like, there's just mess everywhere, and, and just sort of walking through mess, which seems to help. <laughs> Walking through the mess. <laughs> um, but there's a sense of panic for, for a while. Like, how, what, what am I going to do? You know, I've gone too far to turn back. And, and I, plus, I want to <laughs> tell the story. And then, and then there is a sense of, like, okay, now, now I'm going to get down to it and make every sentence what I want it. And so that's a different part of the writing process for me. And I noticed that you mentioned in that answer that you start to like your characters. And I think one of the most amazing skills you have is, as with Alv Kitteridge, to make these somewhat unlikable characters really likable. And I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I do like them. And I think it occurred to me at one point, probably after Olive or during Olive, it occurred to me, well, I don't know when it really when it occurred to me because I'm not so great with time, but um, <laughs> somewhere around there, um, I realized that for me, writing, one of the things, one of the many things I like about writing is that I get to be sort of judgment free because in real life, you know, we're so full of judgment. And to some degree, we have to be, I guess, because we have to make decisions about what's safe and what's not safe and how to live and all that kind of stuff. But to for me to write a story or write a novel, I... You know, I make these people up. I I don't have to um, condemn them. You know, I can watch them behave badly and, and love them. <laughs> because I, I understand why they're behaving that way. And so um, that's, a f that's a nice thing for me. For, you know. But I understand that readers have a very different relationship with them. And they should. <laughs> How did you feel? There's a character at the center of the book who's a... Uh, older woman, middle-aged woman, uh, dealing with empty nest, and you write about that very poignantly, but she's kind of an entitled woman. and it's, Helen Farber Burgess. Yes, yeah, a little who hard. Who just saw. Yes, but you, you managed to make us feel empathy toward her, and I wondered what your own feelings were as you were writing this character. I, I did feel empathy for her because, um, you know, it's not her fault that she came from money. <laughs> it's really not. It's absolutely not. And, and I was completely aware of that as I wrote, that there's absolutely no reason, there's nothing Helen has confronted in her life that would make her think the world was particularly unsafe. And that's just real for some people. And um, so I kind of, you know, snuggled down. And, um, of course, she, you know, has her problems <laughs> eventually because it's a book <laughs> about life. <laughs> But um, but I you know I, I was aware that this is not, I'm not I'm not there to judge um, her 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 background mm -hmm. which is what you know produced her. And what was it like writing in the the Somali voice? Yeah, that was um, that was a real <coughs> choice um, that I just kept not knowing if I was going to go there, if I was going to take on the point of view of a Somali person, because it's scary. I mean, it's like, that's quite, that's pushing my imaginative powers. And yet I thought, if I don't, they'll remain the other. You know, they'll remain exactly what I'm trying to not 
have happened. I'm trying to, you know, show what we all do in our brief little stay here. Um, and, and, and it seemed to me that they needed to have a voice. So I chose this character, Abdi Karim, who somehow sort of spoke to me. And, and, and actually, I felt rather comfortable with him once I, once I got going. And I had done so much work um, that I didn't, you know, by the time I was really sort of um, getting him on the page, I, did, I didn't feel like I was faking it. You know, I didn't, you know, can't do that. That, that wouldn't be um, good for anybody. So, but there was a lot that went into that. But I learned a lot. It was fascinating. I was very, very interested in every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. It may be too soon to ask since the book's just out, but have you had any feedback from the Somali community? I have not. I have not, and I'll be very curious. Mm -hmm. um, there has been some positive feedback from the population in Maine, um, but well, who knows what that means. <laughs> we'll see. Um. And like probably everyone in this room, I absolutely loved Olive Kitteridge. And I found myself as I was reading this kind of wondering if she was going to make a cameo, as she <laughs> often did <laughs> in her own book. So I wonder what it was like to, for you as a writer to write in the shadow of your own success. Right. Well, um, I'm pretty good at denial, and um, <laughs> you know it's something that is given to us by nature, and I respect it. <laughs> the older I grow, I think, oh yeah, that denial stuff is really good. <laughs> and um, so I was aware, at, you know, that I had won this prize and that I had a readership, but it wasn't completely real to me. And so as I was writing, um, as long as I was writing, I was okay. When I looked up, I would think, oh, you know, I, I felt responsible to the new readers that I had brought to my work. And I thought, I don't want to let them down if they come to me expecting a true human emotion and looking for some, you know, honest kind of psychological situation that's real. I don't want to let them down and I don't want to dip below. So that, um, that I, I would think about that, but when, but only when I looked up. Once I was back down working, you, you know, I was just worried about that sense of panic, like what was I going to do with all these pages <laughs> that were floating around the house. Well, speaking of a uh, of sense of panic, we were talking about this a little bit before <laughs> the event, yeah. but I wonder what it's like for you. I mean, writing is obviously a very solitary yeah. occupation, and yeah. then as an author, you're meant to go out and dazzle and tweet oh, and dazzle <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry <laughs> no you're I you're dazzling <laughs> you are dazzling no <laughs> what what is that like brush being, my teeth uh, harder <laughs> <laughs> um well it it's um it it's it's anxiety producing for me um i i guess is what i would say but i do i do really like meeting readers because it is a very solitary endeavor um for those of you that write you know that you're spending it, it's an odd job because you spend you know it it's not like you're alone because you're with your characters but you are alone and you know you're alone and then and then and that's why we're writers because that's what we're supposed to do and then and then all of a sudden there you are and i'm like <laughs> a, a little nervous <laughs> Um, y you touched on this a little bit already, but can you talk a little more about your own writing process? What is, you know, your daily routine <laughs> the mess. and the mess? The mess. <laughs> when do you write? That sort of thing. Well, I, um, I prefer to write as soon, in the morn as soon as I can in the morning, and, and morning isn't necessarily what it might be for you, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't always sleep well. Um, but. But anyway, I, I would prefer to work as soon as, you know, I'm, I'm kind of up and about before I've had a lot of conversations or outside world stuff happening. And, and that's the best time until I get hungry. And that always seems to stop. That always seems to, um, I've noticed it for years and years and years. Even if I think, well, I'll just have a little bit of lunch, it, it cuts something, some sort of energy. And so that the afternoon work is always different from that period before I have what I call lunch. And I even, you know, I eat the same thing for lunch so I don't have to think about it. <laughs> so that it's not a decision, you know, it's just there. But it's still somehow I do notice, you know, I, I can get those few hours in and then lunch will, and then you start thinking about like other stuff that you have to do. Um, and sometimes 
uh, sometimes I used to work very late at night. I would get a second wind around 11 o'clock and I would work, um, you know, for a few hours. Um, I'm not super regimented. It's not in my nature to be super regimented. I'm not one of these people. But I do, but I do um, at times tell myself, you're just going to sit here no matter what. You're just going to sit here. And I can do that because <laughs> I'm sitting. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not doing anything, you know, so. <laughs> and did you, did you study writing formally? I, I did not. Um, I'm, I'm pretty self-taught. The only writing class that I had was with Gordon Lish um, in New York City many, many years ago when I was about, thir I think it was about 30 years old. I took a class. I'd already, already been writing on my own for many years. Um, and he um, had offered a class and I, and I took that class. But otherwise, I'm, I, I taught myself. I made lists of books that I thought I should read and I read them and I tried different styles. You know, I would see artists in museums sketching artworks and so I would think, well, I'll try that myself, you know, let me see what it feels like to write a sentence like, you know, John Updike wrote about this truck and the sound that that truck made. How did he think of those words? And so I would write out the words just to see what it felt like. So, anyway. And I, I heard you uh, interviewed on Diane Rehm the other day, and you mentioned that you'd gone to law school and that oh, you yeah. had even briefly <laughs> practiced law. How does that inform your current profession? Right, the law school <laughs> thing. Um, I um, always knew I wanted to be a writer, and so people said, well, then why did you go to law school? Well, I had um, been like a cocktail waitress for a few years after college and writing my stories and setting them out and not anybody was remotely interested and um, I thought well you know this is going to be depressing in about 50 no in about 30 years I think I thought of myself as depressing in the age of in my 50s <laughs> somehow I thought you know I just didn't want to be a cocktail waitress when I was in my 50s although now I look <laughs> back and I think that is an honest living you know that was but I had to learn that so I thought well you know I have a social conscience so I went to law school and I dropped out of law school, and then I went back to law school, and, and, and I did a lot of reading in law school. But I thought I would, you know, be a lawyer and write at night, but it, it you know, it didn't work. It was, uh, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and are you able to read while you're working on? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And? I'll, I'll, um, I'll very often read things that, do not feel natural for my mind to read. You know, like I'll read about something and I think, well, that's the kind of book that I wouldn't necessarily read, and so I make myself read it to sort of scramble up my head. But do you avoid reading in the same sort of genre? No, the right no, no. Yeah. Mm -mm. Doesn't, that no, I just don't want to be reading bad sentences, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> so... Um, well, do you, as you're writing, do you have a circle of people that you share your work with, or how do you Boy, avoid the bad? No, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm not very uh, much of a group person, it turns out. Um, <laughs> no, I, had, I have had one reader for 30 years who um, was the only person that would see my work, and I would see hers. And um, once in a while, there would be a change to that rule, but I'm, I'm pretty protective of the work, and it almost always ends badly if I break that rule um, because it's just dangerous. It's, it's like, I, and I've come to understand I'm the only one who knows, which is, I think, terrifying, which is one reason that people are always looking for other people to read it, but... You don't want that responsibility. But I'm the only one who knows. And the problem with showing your work to somebody is that they might tell you that it's good and that that's bad because it probably isn't at that point. Um, or you'd know it deep down, really. Um, or they'll tell you it's bad and then you won't have a friend. <laughs> you know, so it's... As Olive Kittred would say, it's tricky business. <laughs> um, and back to the Burgess Boys a little yes. bit. Um, why, why the title, The Burgess Boys, as opposed to the 
there's a there's a Burgess girl right. in there as well. <laughs> the who, Burgess who plays a and central their sister. role. Right. Um, <laughs> well, the sister. I, I first of all, because I conceived it that way, I just saw it and felt very strongly this sense of attachment between these two boys that started when they were boys and continues as they are grown boys. Um, that's the relationship that was most intriguing to me. And their sister is obviously very important. Um, she's almost more of a catalyst uh, in the sense that she, dr- you know, the boys have gone to New York. The boys have tried to reinvent themselves, particularly the older one. They've done what you're allowed to do in this country, which is go off and be somebody else and forget your past and forget your family if you want to and you can and just get out of there. And Jim has had tremendous success and was famous and, you know, poor Bob is like following along behind. Um, so they thought they'd made it out, and then Susan, who stayed in Maine, because that's her nature to be a Mainer and to stay there, gets in real trouble when her son does this, um, because she is a single parent. So she's the catalyst, I think, that sort of changes the dynamic that these three siblings have lived with all their lives. And I, I liked your choice to sh- sort of show some restraint with the, the character of the boy who throws the pig's head, he's actually clearly troubled, but he's not the sort of character we read in books like the Lionel Shriver or there was a Doris Lessing sort of scary, scary monster child. Right, you kind right. of make this, you dial this back. Right. I it, wonder was, it was very you... important to me to make Zachary somebody who was not aware, really not aware of what he'd done, not fully aware of what he had done. Um, and that's part of what I was talking about earlier, being a writer and not having to judge, because in, in real life, this act is reprehensible. You know, to, to, to throw a pig's head through a mosque is, is, is a, a reprehensible act. And so I'm always telling my students, write against the grain, meaning write against what comes naturally to you. Um, and what would come naturally to me would be to think that this person was not such a great person so I'm think so as a writer I get to as a novelist I get to think okay let's let's take this character and make him interesting and complex because in fact we all are interesting and complex no matter what it is that we're doing but it was a chance for me to to um, try and help the reader not, not give the reader an excuse to just go ahead and say okay you're just a bad person but let's let's make that a little more complicated Poor Zach. Um, well, rather than monopolize this, let's uh, let's open this up. I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the audience. If I could remind you to please go to one of the two mics. Hi. Um, my wife and I were Peace Corps volunteers in Somalia. Oh, wow. And we have lots of uh, Somali friends in the United States who are citizens. So I'm really glad that you focused on problems of Somalis in the United States. I'd be interested in what kind of research you did. Yeah. And would you comment on the on the axiom that writers are supposed to write about what they know about? And right. You obviously Cause didn't, I didn't and you've done very well I, at it. I'm I just did exactly how one does that. That's that, exactly. Um, well the first thing I did many years ago uh, when I thought when I knew I was gonna try this, um, I simply started with a book on the history of the country itself. So I, I went, you know, I thought, well, let me, what is, what is Somalia? So I, so I read about the country. I read about, you know, up, you know, the Civil War, the different governments. So I read about as much of the country as I sort of could ingest. And then I moved on to um, the camps. So I read a great deal about the camps. And then I went to um, any event in New York or even in Maine because I couldn't just go knock on the door and say, hi, you know, it's me <laughs> with my, you know, my, my dyed blonde hair. And, you know, do you mind just telling me what it was like? I mean, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, so I had to work for a while to, to make my way into, the, you know, understanding the community. And so, but I would go to any event where, where there were Somali refugees that were talking yeah. and listen and ask questions and then was eventually um, allowed to, well, not allowed, but somebody in, t- in the town that knew some families had me talk to them. Good, nice. I look so, forward to reading it. Thank mm-hmm. you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is an obvious ignorant question, but why 
of all places in the United States did the Somalis choose to live in Maine? In other words, it seems like a very odd place for a group of Somalis right. to settle. Right, right. Well, I'm glad you asked. That's not such an ignorant question. Um, it's um, because there are, there are six or seven places of you know, entry and location where the government, and Portland, Maine is one of them, or was one of them at least. And people um, happen to like Portland, Maine. It's a very nice little city. And so rents are not as cheap there as um, a Somali person might be able to afford. So they realize that 30 miles you know, up and over um, is this town called Lewiston where, you know, where the industry has folded, the textile mills had folded 30 years ago, and rents were cheap. And for them, it was relatively safe um, because, you know, a lot had been in Georgia, a lot had been in places that were not safe, where, you know, they had been in cities where they the only housing they could afford was, was not safe for their children or for them. So that's kind of how they ended up in Lewiston as opposed to Portland. Thank you. Tell me, please, who are some of your favorite writers who have inspired you, and uh, what are you reading these days in your spare time? Right. Um, I think that my, my favorite living writers are um, Alice Munro and William Trevor. I, I just, I've loved them for so many years. I, I just um, love them, love them, love them. And... Um, Always sort of go back to them to kind of center myself if I if I'm feeling you know askew, and I I have just read the four books of Elena Ferrante, the Italian writer um, who was has been published by Europa has put out her and and they're quite um, something quite bracing and and pretty pretty interesting and and well done and then I always um, I've always loved the Russians I just adore all the Russians because you know they just really they just they just mix it up boy <laughs> you know somebody's always having a problem and yeah. I just and they're not shy about it so um, so I, I do love the Russians and I mean there's just so many books yeah, yeah. but but um, thank you and Roth and Updike and <laughs> Um, hello. Hi. I grew up in Maine and uh, fled, uh, as I guess uh, your Burgess boys did. To where like Where did you grow up in Maine? Brunswick. Oh. I, I uh, knew your husband, uh, <laughs> Jim Tierney. He was a couple of grades behind me at Brunswick High School. <laughs> this is kind of how the book begins, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It is kind of how the book begins, yes. Oh, is it? <laughs> I haven't read this one, but I loved all of Kittredge. And, and where did you flee to? Here? Oh, uh, uh, well, <laughs> many places. First to uh, Brown in Providence and mostly here, but overseas for a number of years. I was going to chat with you afterward. But anyway, my because my basic question coming from Maine and, as I said, having fled, is to see how many writers there are now who are based in Maine, uh, and I keep discovering more. I mean, Stephen King, I guess, is the most famous or notorious, but uh, he's certainly not the only one. It used right. to be the South that generated lots of writers. Yeah, uh, the South certainly has generated can, wonderful writers. Is yeah. it because Maine has a similar atmosphere of deprivation, or do you have well, any? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think there's actually something to that. Mm -hmm. I do. I, I used to know um, a, a Southern poet, and, and we would talk about language, and he was um, from a very isolated section of, um, of, of the South, and, and it was a similar kind of mentality um, that we, we understood each other in a, in, a, in a way. There was a sense of territorial, you know, this is, this is ours and we're very isolated and so anybody who comes near us is going to be wrong <laughs> or not right. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, so I think, I think that isolation plays a part in these things and I think, but, partic but in the South, I mean the l use of language in the South is so gorgeous and it's a very, you know, much more oral kind of, um, you know, they're, I think a culture than than in Maine, Maine's where we don't talk laconic. quite so much. I mean, you know, I I blab a lot, but that's why I don't live there. So, um, so, but I I think you know, but the physical beauty of of Maine is just 
I think, immeasurable. And, and so I think there's something that is um, the combination of, of that, of the, you know, the isolation and, and maybe not having a very talkative culture sort of helps build the pressure of all the stories that are being lived and not mm. expressed, oh. combined with the gorgeousness of the <laughs> setting. Oh, Thank you. Nice to meet you, <laughs> Ms. Brunswick. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good evening. Um, you were talking about a very long writing process, and I'm yeah. and thinking about your characters in your head, and I'm wondering if they ever visit you when you're in, you know, out in the street or something. You know, Jim would jump into your head, and you'd have a thought about him, or if, if that's just confined to when you're at the table with your head down. No, I thought about them all the time, almost all the time. Mm -hmm. They were my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, when my daughter was little, she had all her stuffed animals, and she said, those are my friends. And I just remember the way she said that. And I would sometimes think, these are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I did, I would think about them. I mean, not all the time, but I was, uh, yeah, I'm, when I'm deep in work, I'm, I'm working. My head is turning mm -hmm. it around and around and around. and and even though there's a higher and higher chance that I'll forget what I'm thinking, um, I still enjoy thinking it. And <laughs> so, so I think a lot about them. And that's one of the difficulties of finishing a book after so many years of working on it is that, you know, I, I don't think about, I mean, I can't, they're done, they're, they, they, they're, they're gone. And so there is, it's a very strange thing to, to have them finished. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would think about them, or I would think, oh yes, let me remember that. Jim would have, he would feel that way, uh -huh, or uh -huh. she would think that, oh uh -huh. yes, Susan might see it that way. Right, right, okay, thanks. So, makes life really fun, you know, because everything <laughs> is like, hmm. Full, for sure. Full, very full. Yeah, let's <laughs> just go over to this okay, mic sorry, for a hi. minute, and then we'll come back. I was interested in your comment that you encourage your students to write against the grain, mm -hmm. and I think I know oh, why, but, uh, I'd like to know if I'm right. Is it okay. t uh, to make them three-dimensional people and not just black and white yes. one-dimensional people? Yes, because as soon as you, if you're writing something that's comfortable, um, the ch my own experience is the chances will be that it will be two-dimensional. It'll be, it will just slide right over the surface of the table. It will slide over the eye of the reader. It will just slide. Whereas if you write against the grain, and Olive is a great example, because mm. I would think, oh, I can't have her do that. That's awful. And then I would think, you have her do that. That's your job. You don't be careful. And mm. so it's that kind of thing. Because as long as she was acting within Olive-ness, then I had to let her go. I mean, do it. Let her rip. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to ask you a question about your characters, too. And you shouldn't be nervous because you're oh, fabulous okay. up there. Okay. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Um, I was wondering about you talking about, like, your storylines and you have them all over the table. Do you, your, your characters, particularly in all, all of Kittredge, are so amazing. Do you have, like, characters, like, part characters in your head and you're like building them yeah. you know like a cake or yep. something yeah you do yes I, I had a feeling you might. yes and i so do. do you write down parts thank and, you you understand and, do, <laughs> and then you say My what madness. and then you start something you say oh i bet that character would be good yeah i had a feeling that's yeah how you do i it. i do and it just seems to take me so long i don't know why but they, they don't they're show so up incredible. faster they just but you so know i sort of see a wisp of them i think oh there she goes, <laughs> you know, and then six years later, she's a little closer, <laughs> you know, but um, yes, I do. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, you, you referenced um, short, mostly short story writers as your, among your favorites. I wonder Interesting, if you yeah. feel drawn more toward one form or the other? Well, I think that, um, I, th I, I don't feel more drawn more to one than the other but I think that when I was learning when I was teaching myself to write which took many many years um, I was working on short stories for a number of reasons they were very popular back then um, and there I was working with the illusion that they were easier to write than a novel and so I sort of cut my teeth on short stories. So, so I would study short stories in particular, you know, Alice Munro and, and William Trevor. So they were kind of like my first private little teachers. And, 
and um, poets. I read a lot of poetry. Um, I, I don't really know much about poetry, but I read a lot of it, and I cut out my little favorite poems, and I stick them in a book, and I feel all happy because all my favorite poems are in a book together, and, and I just like poems. I like the way they sound. So I, I do these things, but I don't, um, but, you know, the, the Russians, th those are big, fat novels, and, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and um, Magic Mountain was a nice, big, old, fat thing that was fun, but... Um, so I don't, I don't particularly feel drawn. Um, it's, it's really what the story requires. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the Burgess voice was just, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no way this was going to be in a story. And with Olive, how did, how did well, that Well, I understood right away that Olive was going to be a group of stories. I, I don't know why. You know, it's a wonderful thing when something happens unconsciously and you realize it's right. <laughs> Um, because that doesn't always happen. But I think because she was so episodic and so ferocious in her actions that I realized, you know, okay, there's, it, it doesn't have, to, it, there's not anything linear about Olive's experience. And do you, do you have an attachment to any of your own books in particular? If, if somebody asked what to, where to begin reading you, what would you say? Um, I would say you could begin at the beginning <laughs> with with Amy and Isabel. I can't I can't um, I can't I can't say that I have a favorite book. I don't actually know if I do, but if I did I wouldn't feel right saying it. But I really don't know why that I do. And you evidently have one um, under the table somewhere, some oh, well abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what I have under the table? <laughs> we'll see <laughs> when I get home and clean out. But you have a, had a first novel you mentioned uh, that oh. you started and did I mention that on Diane Reem, I think. You oh, I did that. mention that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awful. It was awful. <laughs> but but what was interesting, when I dropped out of law school, I wrote a novel. But um, but what was good about that was I understood I could do it. Right. Like I understood I could, you know, it's like running. It's like, oh, okay, I can actually, I can make the track. Uh, it was awful, and I got rid of it quickly. <laughs> and have you begun the next project? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just making messes. <laughs> you know, thinking about those things yeah. and and do you uh, do you begin and abandon novels or do you I I do novels? abandon I abandon a great deal because um, I write a lot of stuff that's just not very good and um, and I'm old enough to know that now and so but it doesn't stop me from writing it but I at least recognize that that doesn't need to go any further <laughs> um, you know so that but that you know that takes a <laughs> a year or so. It's like, oh, you know, you guys are just, you're not cutting it. You're too, too dull. That's not the story. Or so, but I, but I have to play around a little bit and see. But, but I'm, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll abandon. Sure, I will. Absolutely. I don't, I don't feel that um, pull that I other writers say. Well, I don't want to get rid of it. I sort of, um, I don't feel that way. I'm, I, I want, I want a nice sentence. <laughs> If I can't have it, I don't want it. <laughs> um, we have another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Right See? Blah, blah. <laughs> no. Um, you mentioned about your students. Mm. So you teach writing? I have not actually taught for a couple of years, but I did teach for many years. So, well, I don't know where to go with that, but you taught, <laughs> your, you taught yourself, but you think writing is something yeah. that you can... That's well, anyway, that's here. a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I taught myself, so why am I teaching others? Um, and and that's a that's a really good question. I think that naming things, you know, because people say can can writing be taught, and that's a valid question. I think that naming things can always help. And so, if I have students, I can talk to them about authority. You know, I can talk to them about voice. I can talk to them about positioning the reader. I can give them terms that I think help clarify. And I could never do what they do, which is sit in a workshop together and talk about each other's work. Um, and I always run, you know, I've, I've, I, I mean, I think maybe somebody will stand up and say I'm wrong, but I, I you know, I've, I've al I always run very wimpy workshops. <laughs> you know, I'm always like, oh, that's really nice. Well, okay. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, because, I mean, I can't, you know, and somebody will say, well, I didn't like it. I don't know. Oh, no, well, it's, 
<laughs> so I, you know, I don't know that I'm very effective. <laughs> we have a question over here. Yes. Just a thought that came to me when you were talking about poetry, I suddenly wondered, do you think of your books as being read aloud or sort of read privately? Um, I think of them as being read privately, but I think of the voice as being a real sound in the reader's head. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very conscious that in that intimate private relationship that one has when you open a book or, or, on, or download a book or however you're getting hold of that story, there's immediately a very private, intimate relationship that you're having with the person who wrote it, with the voice that's coming off the page. And so for me, the way that voice sounds is essential because that's what the reader um, that that's that will carry everything to the reader. Um, so I don't think of it so much as being read aloud, but I but the reader must hear it in his or her head. So that's very important to me. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, that thank was you wonderful. all. You're so sweet to come. Thank you very very much. <laughs>